Well, I can't say I've ever been to something like this before. <laughs> really? Yeah, we're doing a skate demo at a freaking fair, dude. Oh, I thought you'd never been to a fair before. Oh, yeah, I've been to lots of fairs, but <laughs> not one that has a rodeo and all this crazy stuff, so yeah, this, this is, is very interesting. This is very particular. Yeah, it, it's funny because all these guys come from around the world to, to this contest. Yeah. And this is their perception of Vancouver. <laughs> this? Yeah, it's like not even <laughs> Vancouver. We're like... 45 minutes out of van and like if, if they don't take the train or the bus into town like they're never gonna know they, they come see this and then they go home and they go i went to vancouver it was crazy all the cowboys <laughs> uh, oh my gosh there's like no cowboys in van yeah <laughs> it's like a normal city like la but this is what they perceive <laughs> oh, dude. that's so sick yeah it smells like it smells like what it smells like, it smells like medicine in here <laughs> Sounds like, sounds like sage or something. Where's he running off to? Oh, okay. This is the street league of freestyle. <laughs> it might not look like it, but it just shows where freestyle's at right now. I know many of you may be nervous. For a long time, my philosophy came from Duke Hanamoku, our 1912 Olympic competitor, or one swimming in and surfing the West Coast. This guy talking is the first ever the best pro skateboarder. In the water is Rush the one having the most fun. That was my philosophy. If you're not having fun. Oh, 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 oh,
Next to it, I'm very technically guarded.
awesome. How's that for a start? That was great. I still got to warm up. On top of all that other stuff I just said, there's a trick I've been really working on for years and I'm super close. And I think one of the things holding me back is having a confident place where it would be the right place to land it. And I think that the world roundup could be the perfect atmosphere in order to land this trick. The ground is perfect. So spending time to get that trick for my video part, I think that's worth it. And that'll take a lot of focus in itself, but a different kind of focus with different timelines. With my timeline. Your timelines. Not no, okay, go now. Which <laughs> is a beautiful thing as well. I don't want to take away from that. But, uh, drastically different though. Drastically different. And it, and it gives me a goal. It gives me a task that I can focus on so I'm not just being there. Plus, dude, this trick is going to be so sick. I'm so excited for it. This is the right ground, the right space. And to attach it to this event, it's beautiful. It's like at Tampa when I didn't qualify for semifinals and I did the dark slide down the rail. You know, get the trick. Sick. Get the trick. <laughs> Tell when he's hippy Mike when he walks over here. Where'd you go? Oh, here he is. I never guess what you call him that, right? Why would you call this guy Hippie Mike? I just want to give one more thing before I pass the mic. This guy does so much for skateboarding. He's going to give you a little bit of history. He has a skateboard park in Hope. Lights it up. So many kids over the last two years have gone from this big to that big who are incredibly talented skateboarders because of this guy. Gives him a home 24-7, 365. Thanks, Kevin. The most emotional part of the day. Don't you know I'm a crybaby? <laughs> I'm just joking. But thanks, thanks again to Christian for that. Tony was an awesome, awesome friend, and uh, that was a great tribute. So we are here at the Cloverdale Rodeo for the ninth annual World Roundup. Let's make some noise for that. I don't know, 250 skateboard events in this town of Surrey over the years, and uh, also taught thousands of kids how to skateboard in the city. So one of them happens to be standing right beside me right here. This is Andy Anderson. Have you heard of him before? 20 years ago, 2003, I was teaching lessons at the South Surrey Skate Park, and uh, Andy's sister was in my lessons and his mom came up to me after and asked would my son be allowed in the lessons he's not old enough because the age category was nine years old but uh, nine to thirteen he was only seven at the time and I said well if he knows how to skateboard I have no problem with that and so she brought him out made him do a couple test runs in front of me and I said yeah he should be fine so he was already naturally talented and had skateboarded for about three years at the time at age seven. So that started a long, lifelong relationship where uh, we worked together privately after I taught one lesson with him for a week. I said, you know, let's do some private lessons and we would meet up twice a week. Andy was one of those kids that, you know, his parents really cared about him. So they would pull him out of school to go skateboarding. Make some noise for that. So we would do private lessons while all the other kids were at school and he was learning how to make real money, you know? And uh, it just it just went on and on and on. We, at, at one point, Andy was actually the one that took over the lessons from me. He was the one teaching those lessons to the kids. So it was awesome to watch him grow into that. And I sponsored him with protest skateboards around age 15 and we started traveling and going to contests in places like California and New York and Montreal and all these big events that just helped him get his name out there and we had a lot of fun. Andy made all my first YouTube videos and got me to get Instagram and sponsored me with your skate shop Authentic and got me like he got me my shape on Powell 
this, this ain't over. This is just part of life. This is Andy Anderson. He has been, well, he's a top pro. He was in the Olympics. He represented Canada at the very first ever Olympics with skateboarding in it. You know, pretty friggin' awesome. Um, and you know, they made everyone wear a helmet at that contest. Andy was probably the only person that wasn't thrown off by that. So that was awesome. That's true. But, uh, but yeah, as Andy said, we, we've done a lot together and we're not done. This is, he's, he's one of my kids, you know, and we're best friends. And today he's going to show you why his skateboard was the number one selling board in the world for the last five years. Freestyle is one of his divisions of skateboarding. He can literally skate everything. He is the world's all-around skateboarder. Uh, this place and these contests was where he was discovered by George Powell, who owns to uh, Powell Peralta, who brought up Tony Hawk and Steve Caballero on Edge Mountain and Kevin Harris and a few other guys out there that you may have heard of over the years. So when he asked me if he could sponsor Andy, I had to say yes, of course, because he's George, but it was a blessing and uh, very proud of where he's gone. You ready? And I was designing my own board for Mike's company, so George asked him, and he said, okay, you can take him, but you gotta make sure he gets his own board, because we've already spent two years designing it. And then that's the same board that's been selling so well, so that's all. And he had a birthday last month. He is officially 27 years old. 20 years after we met. Just some little ranch at the park. Let's just pump him up. This is freestyle skateboarder Andy Anderson. One of the most consistent skateboarders. And you see what he's got there? Those are original 1960s play wheels on that little plant he's gonna ride to. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Developing his run by watching all the other masters of skateboarding. Putting all their tricks together in a way that we need to do.
Every single year for this? I have for every year they've had it in person I've been here. Yeah. Wow! Yeah, yeah. So that's like ten years in a row? Jeez, yeah, we had three years I think that we didn't have it because of the pandemic. Oh, okay. But uh but yeah, since 2012. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, that's and fun. you won it in 2014? Yes. Dude, props, dude. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a fun time. Cool. Oh, so dude. What about this contest is different than any of the other contests in America, at least? Because I know there's a lot of freestyle contests in Japan and Europe, but not too many in um, in North America. Yeah, so this is an interesting one because I think it draws a much different crowd. Um, like a lot of the Japanese contests are fairly local or national. Mm -hmm. so you get a lot of Japanese skaters come together. Europe has a, a lot more of the European scene, obviously. Uh, this is definitely more worldwide competition year after year. You get people from everywhere. Everywhere. Romania, Japan, uh, usually Australia and Brazil are really well represented. Um, the States, obviously in Canada. So um, it's consistently the, one of the most international contests out here. That's so sick. That's really cool. Dude, I love how friendly everyone is too. Like everyone cheers for each other. There's not really that much like, I don't know, it doesn't seem like people are like, it's not so cutthroat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I think because like freestyle is kind of it's a bit smaller and like we a lot of people who are compi compi yeah, a lot of people who are competitors and like are in like, the top ranks or whatever of the freestyle competition scene saw it from when it was ultra small and we knew every single person. We kind of know how important it is to like make sure everyone feels welcome and wants keep it to growing. Be here. Yeah, exactly. Keep it growing. Yeah. So it's, it's nice. It makes me want to come back every year. Yeah, dude, it's dope. I would definitely come back to this again. Yeah, it's a good time. So I'm glad you're having a good time, man. Yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> good seeing you, bud. Good seeing you, Russ. This is Russ Howell. This is the first professional skateboarder ever, and he's still skateboarding out here. And <laughs> people ask, you know, what age do you have to stop skateboarding? And I always say, I know this guy, Russ, and he's the first ever pro, and he's still skating. So maybe when he stops skating, <laughs> Then I'll, uh, then I'll know the age, but. <laughs> George Bernard Shaw said, you don't stop playing because you get old, you get old because you stop playing. And, you know, Aristotle said, if we are the playthings of the gods, then let us live lives as play. Yes. And uh, skateboarding, you know, allows a lot of things. It's an individual sport. It's not like those team sports that you need a lot of people to do it with. And so bringing the sport to your heart you really can't get out of it because skateboarding has been such a good friend I know a lot of people think oh is it a sport is it an art form is it a lifestyle no it's a friend I and like so that you don't give up your friends never no and you know it's it uplifts you and that's what friends do it's and it moves you forward <laughs> and that's what friends do and it elevates your spirit and that's what friends do and so skateboarding will always be my friend. I'll always skate. That's awesome, man. Thank you. Let's wait till Andy. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> well, you've worked with Stacy for a long time. 
Oh yeah. I remember the watching. What is it? The Skateboard Kings, and they, you have your piece talking about wearing pads and doing the freestyle demos and all that stuff. That, that's hilarious stuff, and that's like super important to skateboarding. And you've always been a representation for skateboarding and the good kind of skateboarding. And like, and you're still doing that today. It's just amazing to think that you have the same voice, demeanor, and intention behind your work that you did way back in the 70s and 80s like how, like how does that feel how do you how do you keep it up but you know it's, it's it's ironic because going in and turning skateboarding into a professional sport money was never the intent that was always a side effect and people would pay you to go around the world and do what you love most and you know a person's true wealth is never made up of entirely by the abundance of their possessions alone and so you always seek to fill your heart and from that comes happiness and if you've got a bucket of oh this is being unhappy this is being unhappy a lot of people choose to be unhappy because they do things that don't lead to that and skateboarding said hey serve me and so if you want to be great in anything you become the servant you know, it doesn't matter something else you know yeah, right. You do what's right. Yeah, it's beautiful, man. Yeah. Beautiful. And this guy held the world record. You still hold the world record for most 360s on a board, right? Yeah, that is so weird because growing up, I was the worst. I, I couldn't do a 360, and I used to kidnap this little 12-year-old kid that could do three, and I'm thinking, that's impossible. And <laughs> finally, after 20 years of only being able to do two 360s, I was helping people, and all of a sudden, you know, the ability came to me and it was a gift and I'm going I can only do these things because I'm using them as tools to help other people and I know where that comes from and everything it's like I'm just on this board for the ride yeah yeah and and then you held the world record that no yeah. one's still beat till today. Like, yeah. not even today. Like, yeah. It's going to yeah. probably go down for a long time, bro. Like, the, the, the winner for the 360 contest was 25 spins. What was your record? 163. That's unbelievable. 163. That's no pumping. That's no two board where you can get more speed. That's just, like, one hook. It's and when you spin, a lot of people go, how do you keep from getting dizzy? And when you spin, there's this, the brightest spot on the horizon creates this white line. And so if you, if you keep your balance in life on the things that are unseen, your balance will be spot on. It will be centered. Yeah. But a lot of people look at things and go, oh, this can knock me off. This can knock me off. But no, you, you got to have the faith on, you know, where you're at and centered. Way to turn That's 360s into a life lesson, man. <laughs> thanks, you, Russ. thanks a lot for my the interview, Russ. Thank you. And Thank how you, old Andy. are you now? I'll be 74 in three months. Dang! Wow. This Killing guy it. also did handstand, jump, like ollie, I guess, over a board. What? Landing back in handstand. No way. Like, yeah, this is no joke. Oh, yeah, there you go. What the heck? That's incredible. Russ Howell, everybody. <laughs> At the World Roundup! <laughs> this ain't no joke. Hi, buddy. Hi, Kevin. Hey, Kev. Hey, How you doing, dude? Good, 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 good. Cool, man. So, uh, can you give us some history on the, uh, the showdown? Yeah, so, um, freestyle in kind of the 80s was one of the you know big parts to the event. In 1990, I witnessed uh, the meeting that happened when street skating was getting so popular that freestyle was, wasn't going to be part of the NSA anymore. And I remember hearing that going, it's kind of over. There's nothing, everyone's it's going to be this, turned into this underground scene. Yeah. So, you know, through the, through the 90s and stuff, it went, uh, you know, very underground. And we went from stadium type of uh, contest to these underground events that were just seriously, insanely, here's a piece of paper, five people watching. I was just like, what are we doing? So it took, in 07 I was in Japan, and Japan really lit it up for a freestyle contest at a shopping mall. And at that shopping mall, uh, now you got general population, right? And I've always thought that about freestyle. You can put us anywhere, in, in the parade, in the mall, anywhere in a fair, and, and, and people are just gonna come in and watch. 
So I came back in 07 saying, we gotta start doing this in Canada at that level. Let's pick up fair and let's get it going and bring the general population in to watch skateboarding, uh, to create new skateboarders, right? Because when you go to a skateboard event, you already got those guys. This is mom and dad coming off the Ferris wheel with a bag of popcorn, sitting down watching something that they don't know exists, which is Flatland. So, um, We've always been about that to generate, you know, more awareness of skateboarding, and uh, and that's what the vibe is is here. Uh, it's been underground for so long, but definitely there's this whole freestyle movement now, and it's gaining popularity very, very quick. And a lot of it is because of a lot of things that's happened, and a big part of it's been Andy on uh, making that, that little thing on, showcasing it so it doesn't look like this crazy thing off to the side. If Andy's doing it, it must be cool. And that's been a big help factor in the world creating uh, what people think of Flatland Freestyle Skating. Awesome, man. Everything that I've done for freestyle is because of Kevin. Inspired by Kevin, all the flow kind of footwork. <laughs> I, I, When I was a kid, I loved Primo's Caspers, but what really got me going was the flow and kind of moving around on the floor and that's what Kevin has always mastered and kind of specializes in. The smoothness. The smoothness. Is, the nickname yeah. is the Iceman, right? So mm. This is just... That was your nickname? Yeah. Yeah, that's sick. So, so, yeah, yeah. And riding for Powell and all those connections, I just thank you, Kevin, for hosting this event, bringing me, introducing me to all the rest of the freestylers in the world. Because that there were they were enough freestylers to like down on your hands at the beginning of this stuff. Really? Yeah. So honestly, like uh, when Andy first started entering this event, you could have sat me down, Nigel, and said, "Name every freestyling from every country." I would have been able to grab a piece of paper or anything and write them all down, knowing them by name, seeing their videos. There was I'm gonna say there was maybe 25, 30 guys solid. Wow. Uh, maybe up to 50. Um, Japan, though, has taken it to a whole new level. And one of the reasons that I think from the business side watching that is Japan always looked at skateboarding very much how Andy looks at skateboarding. It's skateboarding. Yeah, all right? of it. All of it. All all, of I don't it. care what you do, it's all about it. So when Andy was going through his teenage years, think of the peer pressure on that. Yeah. You know, think of the peer pressure when Andy was at a skateboard park. What are you doing, dude, spinning around? What are you doing, dude, with the <laughs> helmet, right? And most teenagers at 14, 15, 16, we get the pressure's too much. Yeah. Right? I'm just going to They get transform. crushed. Right? They get crushed. And they go, I better be the cool guy, you know, over here. And uh, again, I think you heard me mention it yesterday. Again, think, like, I gave an award away last, way at the, at last year at the Seventh Generation for the most overall skateboarder, which in the 70s was part of it. You tried to do everything, slalom, high jump, 360s, vert, everything. Think, of, who's in the number two spot for Eddie? How do I pick another guy? Yeah. <laughs> Right? Who is one of the best in the world at three different disciplines of the sport? Show me number two. I can't think of anyone I who else think does of anybody freestyle. That's, I that's mean, the maybe problem. it's starting to happen a little yeah. bit more, but right now I cannot think of anybody in the mind that would take that trophy away from this guy. Yeah. And, and, and it's going to happen. You know, over time, it's, it's just it's going to happen because, again, what you guys are witnessing here, this, like, to, another great story I think I have is we left, uh, I, I was driving with Stacy Peralta from San Diego up to LA to fly out of, out of town and we were driving up at night and this is when freestyle it was going to be over right there was no more professional freestyle competition so we were thinking to ourselves and Rodney and the reason one of the main reasons was Rodney was so damn good was why hold freestyle contests when he's going to win anyway I remember yeah. hearing that comment right and Stacy and I were like hopefully one day in our lifetime that street and freestyle combine yeah and look at how long that took Right? Look at along that trick. And this guy like is the guy years. that exactly. And this is the guy that brings it to the table. Is yep. combining everything together. Right? And 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 that's what's just mind boggling to me how long it took. Right? And finally somebody comes to the table that it took a long time for him to get accepted, but it's it's accepted. Yeah. yeah. For you it was obvious as soon as freestyle was gone, it was like, okay, who's gonna bring it to street? No, yeah, exactly. I mean, Rodney took the tricks to street, but nobody did the combination of the two, really, yeah. right? So, um, yeah, so I, yeah, again, I've thanked him so many times for this, and, 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 and that's what I, I mean, I've always thought, to me, skateboarding has always been about the, the, the fun, and what friggin', what better way to learn skateboarding than on the friggin' flat? Yeah. Our industry has gone, you know what? You're nine years old, you're gonna skateboard, learn to kickflip, learn to ollie. Yeah. And I don't know how many times Drop sure, in. <laughs> right? And Andy's probably been the same way. Coaching kids, the first thing they come up is they want to learn the ollie, uh, 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 a kickflip. I go, can you push 
from here to point B, they can't. No. All they want to do is tic-tac? learn a kickflip. Yeah. Right? Can you, can you change that? Tick, please tic tac first. Heel toe. Learn heel how toe. to right and learn how to do something on the flat. Learn how to turn tic tac, and then if you become the best street skater in the world, fantastic. Right, yeah. but you started out the way you should. Like and we talked about that. It's like bringing somebody to a hockey game, an eight-year-old, and go, "Can you do a slap shot at 90 miles an hour over the goalie's shoulder?" When you get him on the ice, it was the first, very first time. That's what we're doing in our industry. Yeah, it's yeah. true. The standard is too high. Well, thanks for everything, Kev. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. It's amazing. <laughs> Bye. And manuals and tic tacs aren't easy. No, exactly. <laughs> they take time to learn. Exactly. Maybe as much time as a kick <laughs> And it's just like. How do you get that? It's so annoying for me when I see guys kickflip and then they they go to fall and they don't even know how to move their board to save themselves from the fall because they never yeah. learned how to tic tac. Yeah. And that happens. That's ridiculous. People can't ride and, and, and they're tricks. Yeah, he's got me going. And the other thing I, I just I just gotta add add to this too is <laughs> you know when you got that if you're a parent you got that eight or nine year old that is going to a skateboard park for the very first time right mm-hmm. and exactly you said earlier drop in whatever like the kid should learn on the flat first so what does he do guess what he's going to get next is a scooter yeah. something with handles because you know what the very first time on a scooter with handles they you're rolling in, in. yeah so yeah, that yeah. eight-year-old doesn't fall doesn't get hurt but if you would have had that eight-year-old practicing tic tacs and then get to a skate report four five six eight days later yeah. that kid would have been successful at the been fine. would have been completely fine yeah we're wrong in society to take your kid to a skateboard park when he's learning how to skateboard yeah until he learns friggin i totally flat. agree with that 100 percent. right 100 that, that, that is where we got to be as an industry going forward is going this is something different and and again you talk to anybody in it what I, so you got me going here is you got the one we of the love be- it, Kevin. We, we love it. We got one of the best skateboard parks in BC right there within a rock throw of this event. Go right now and see who knows about this event. Yeah. Zero. Right? Crazy. Unless these guys are coming out and going skate at the skate park, but go over there and look at the best street skaters that are skating there right now. No idea what's going on here. No idea that a Zamo Yamamoto is here. The best yeah. freestyle skateboard in the world. Period. Hands down. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. It, right? This it's is our nuts. street league and no one cares. <laughs> they will one day though. Yeah, yeah, no. Thank you. No, <laughs> yeah, of course. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you. Kevin. Thanks a lot, you guys. <laughs>
but uh, I'll tell you the same thing I told Ray Addington, who asked me to put on skateboard comp demos at, at his super value stores that are all throughout British Columbia. If you really want the people to be here to see this, it needs to be a contest. And we used that same formula that I used back in the, in the early 70s for Ray for Expo. And uh, I told him, I says, but I need $10,000 in prize money <laughs> to bring him here. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the catch. <laughs> so now here we are in Cloverdale. And, and Dave is saying, hey, we, could you put on, uh, you know, world-class demos with all these guys coming? I'll say, I'll tell you the same thing I told the guys at Expo, Dave. You know, you want the world to be here. It doesn't, it's not demos. It's got to be a contest, and I need 10000 bucks for prize, prize money. Now, it took him a couple months to get back to us. So this was 2011, Nigel, that this actually took place. And um, that would have been in May, and they didn't actually get back to us until August. So we were thought, no, maybe it isn't going to happen. So we started working on it, and uh, there's a lot of man hours that goes into this. Um, the I'm the guy behind the scenes that puts it all together, gets the sponsorship, gets the letters together, the bios for the skaters and all that kind of deal. And then when it comes to actually running the contest, that's when my volunteer force comes in. Because we take uh, four days to set up the contest site with all the banners, the scaffolding towers, uh, all the displays and stuff like that, and then to run the event. So there's about uh, 25 of us. Um, we're not all there at the same time. We're all doing different things. And um, we lost one of our dear friends uh, this last year. His picture's right over there. His name is Tony Lum. He was sort of my right-hand man, took uh, two weeks off every year and just dedicated himself to me. Um, the hat he's wearing is right up here next to my old vintage skateboard and, and also his, uh, oh, and a little farther over here, <laughs> there's the hat, and there's his drumsticks. He was a drummer as well. There's the there's the there's the uh, the blueprint for Sealand Skateboard Park. Myself, Kevin Harrison, and a few other guys who are friends, Nico Weiss and Rob Leshgold. I think that's where we're going today. Yeah. Oh, you're gonna love it. Yeah. Well, we were the we were the designers along with Kaylin Sinclair. Yeah. Awesome. Here, Rodney Mullins signed a board for me, but he used black. He used black ink. I can what? see I it. Can't, I can't make it up. <laughs> I think I see Rodney's nip signature there. Thanks for all you do. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I just got a new signature. Look at this. Andy, Andy, Andy just signed a board. Cheryl and I. Cheryl's sort of the guy that discovered Andy. She, mm -hmm. he, he had a bunch of his pals were skating down below, and they were kind of making some noise. Or the board, the guys in the board room were, were uh, the, the saying it was too loud. So she went down to talk to him, and she didn't want to scare him away. She just, hey, there's a big contest happening at the Cloverdale Rink. You guys need to come over and check it out. He did. He signed up. I think he came in fifth that first year. Wow. Anyway. Anyway. So a little bit of memorabilia and everybody uh, saying thanks over the years, which is great. But the rodeo, um, uh, they've been true to us. Uh, we we were physically, we've had the contest there eight years before the pandemic hit. And then at that time, we switched over to a new format. We went to an online competition, paired up with Braille skateboarding to uh, have the live feed on their network. I think we had 110 skaters that could that submitted videos. We had a panel of five international judges that judged it. And then and I think we had six divisions and then we put them in um, ascending order with uh, the lowest score first and the last score being the highest uh, score. And next year we had 178, it was crazy. Jeez. So we saw it as a, a wonderful opportunity for the kids that would never be able to afford to come to Canada to be a part of the roundup. Because the roundup's pretty special. It's not just a contest. It's a, it's a large contest. Is it the largest contest in the world? I think Christian Heiss's European Euro contest has probably got more contestants in it. The more they have a bigger uh, uh, a drawing field because they're right there in Europe. But we certainly have um, usually somewhere in the 50s into the 60s in regards to contestants coming from all the world. I think one year we had 15 countries represented here. Wow, which is a good representation. Um, at the cost to, to get here is very costly. So for the online competition, those those guys were able to be a part of it. And one thing that's very important about the Roundup, because it's taking place at a rodeo, is that rodeos always give these honking big belt buckles to the guys when they win, right? So, excuse me while I just reach out of frame here for a second. <laughs> Everybody gets a belt buckle type of deal, all right? And this one happens to be from... Uh, 2020 uh this was one of our online competitions <laughs> but as you can see behind me here uh, here's the, the first eight years up here are those belt buckles 
And then down here are the two online competitions that Terry, uh, Terry Chewy and I uh, produced, as well as the one for the buckle from this year. That's so cool. So they all got a belt buckle, and they got the t-shirt, and they were ecstatic. They were part of the Royal Roundup, even though they weren't able to be here. We hope to be able to pull that off again. Um, it was a huge undertaking. Believe it or not, it was twice the work as, as the physical contest. When you're <laughs> it's just so many emails to answer and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think part of the charm of the Roundup is, and we were just thrilled, everyone was so excited that it was happening again, is the fact that it's like a family reunion. It's uh, a joyous opportunity to be back together. I know a lot of sports, when you go there, the pros are very protective of why they are good as good they are. They don't share their tricks of the trade. Well, in freestyle, they do. And they'll sit there and they'll mentor and they'll show it to you time and time again. So you've got the younger, younger skaters being uh, taught, nurtured, by these uh, pros, which is wonderful. So it, it's, um, it's a, is it a summer camp? Is it a contest? Is it a family reunion? I think it's all that. And um, the, the public just thrives on it. There are people here that come every year. They would not miss the roundup. One of the, uh, there's a guy on uh, one of the local TV stations and he tells you about all the highlights, what's coming up this week. And the other night he was on there and he says, look, what, it's back. The World Roundup is back. I can hardly wait to get out there and watch it. And he gave it the extra punch, but he didn't, didn't give anything else, you know. So even he was excited that, uh, that uh, it was back. And um, I think the audience, uh, we had a good, good crowds, even on Monday, which normally is kind of a quiet day. It's the day we do all the special tricks, 360 spinoff and best stationary, this best handstand. Uh, Kevin and, and uh, Terry did an excellent job. So I've got two co-producers here. I've got my uh, Kevin Harris, of course, and I have been doing this from day one. Kevin Harris is more so the, the guy at the contest. I sort of put it all together, and then he's there to do the emceeing and, and um, the, um, the voice of, uh, of the for meeting with the, the skaters and, the, and the, all the media. And a couple of years ago, we added Terry Chu to, to our, our uh, team. And Terry's a very gifted artist. He's designed several of the buckles and the t-shirts that we have and uh, gifted in regards to social media. So Terry handles all that. And um, we're a pretty good team, I think. Yeah. Team to do a pretty good job. Skaters like it. I um, love the event. I thought great. it was it's great. Fun, isn't it? Yeah. It it's, was it's, super fun. Yeah. It's uh, a lot of hype and stuff to it, you know, and, and we tried to... As you also the things one of the things we hope got to see all the all the displays that we have Nigel because mm -hmm. um, one of the things there is that we wanted to highlight certain things not just not just freestyle but skateboarding in general when Kevin and I first started this uh, in 2012 our goal was to uh, introduce skateboarding to the population and we wanted to do it through freestyle um, and we, we see it as a, a people are going to relate to it a little bit better than going down the side of stairs. Or, or a railer and that kind of stuff. It looks dangerous and it can be dangerous. I mean, you know, you film it all. You know how many times, <laughs> you know how many times Andy <laughs> bails out to get, the, to get the good shot. That's true with everybody. So anyway, so we saw freestyle as as the means to do it. And uh, yeah, it really, it really worked, it really worked. I think it does yeah. beautifully. So anyway, uh, we uh, hope that uh, it will continue on and um, Rodeo, I was talking to them yesterday when I was in there putting things away and they were, they haven't given us the A-OK -okay yet for next year, but we hope they will. Uh, they certainly were pleased with the crowds that we had, you know, and uh, that's sort of where we're at. Cool. Thank you so much for everything, Monty. You're quite I welcome, really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. So we have a lot of displays at the Roundup and one of them is the Skateboard Museum. And my friend Tony Lum, who helped me out each year and passed away in January, Tony and I were talking one day and we said, you got extra trucks and wheels? Oh, yeah, I got lots. Well, why don't we combine them? We could do the history of trucks and wheels type of deal. So we started to gather stuff, Nigel, and this is what we came up with. Nick Ballou's dad, uh, Ron, who's incredible, made, these, made two of these decks for us. So Tony has one and I have one. And we started to we, we started to break down what we had wheels and trucks and put them in chronological order. Uh, Victor Victor uh, Victor from uh, Portland gave us these old roller skate wheels, and my very first skateboard was exactly that. Wow! It was my roller skates, and I just screwed them to a piece of plywood. P. D. Dukeman of Skull Skates gave me these, 
He said, I came across that guy had 600 of these things. Brand new, never used. But those are probably from the late 50s into the 60s. Jeez. You know, and then here's your Chicago trucks and wheels. When I first moved to Canada, I bought a pair of these. I was on these down in Utah. When I came up here, they must have been expensive because it was me and two other guys that went in to buy it. It was $12.50 plus shipping. <laughs> and the problem with these suckers is when they hit a rock, they stop dead. Then, the next course, then the urethane wheel comes out. And these are Rolls-Royce uh, uh, urethane wheels. Open ball, ball bearing. So you have to you have to clean them out, you know. Wow. Like the these are Bane trucks. And my la my next board was the, literally bam, bam, with the Bane trucks. <laughs> and Cadillac wheels, however. And then I had the Bennett Pros. Here's my Road Rider 4s. Which... <laughs> 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 and then, uh, I can't, what do we got here? I think we got some trackers and... These are these are Sims, and these are uh, oh gosh, I'm having a hard time. These are Kryptonics. These are yo-yos. The Ellen O'Neill gave me these yo-yos, and this 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 um, this uh, oh, Goldwing truck that Jim Goodrich gave me. That's da awesome. Daniel Gesmer. This is the seismic truck. I you remember the year when they were on those little small tiny wheels? wheels. Yeah, crazy, crazy, crazy. That's when I started '94. Right, it was right at the end of it. <laughs> and then here's pretty well the state of the art right now. Your Fury trucks, and uh, uh, George Powell or and Michael Foucault gave me these. The dragons. The dragons. They just arrived. They just arrived in town, and I scooped a pair up for the board. That's so cool. So anyway, I was wondering what that was. I was looking at it from the corner of my eye, like, what is that thing? Yeah. So <laughs> so I've got. A, this one is gonna is gonna be here, and then the other one uh, we'll pull out at the roundup and put it in in the uh, display. The show, yeah. And there's a lot of other displays there too that are noteworthy. This year we always we have a Masters of the Art of Freestyle display. We've Russ Howe was featured one year, Gunter was featured another year, Farrah Willander, uh, Gavin Harris. This year it was Rodney Mullen, the display. There's a display on skate parks. There's a display on uh, the artwork of. Jim Goodrich, uh, of the uh, Pal Perot, of V.H. Uh, Johnson, all his his artwork, which is crazy, and the stories behind them. It's a wonderful display. Jim Goodrich has got a display in regard to his art. This year, we also set up a memorial wall for all those skaters that have passed on, and uh, Ellen O'Neill and a few others. In fact, the skater on this year's belt buckle is Ellie Myers from Belgium, who passed away in 2021. So honor her that was on the belt buckle, the t-shirt, and uh, on that display. So, yeah. So it's sort of the displays are part of it all, too. We're trying to give everybody... And we had an incredible display in regards. The girls just want to have fun featuring the girls from all around the world, all different aspects of skating. I think you guys did a great job with the displays. I was yeah. definitely checking them out and, like, understanding what you guys were trying to achieve with it. And yeah. I think you did it just great. Cherry did a display strictly in regards to freestyle gear and where we are today in that because it's kind of hard to get it. So there's a couple smaller companies that are pumping out stuff. And so he highlighted their products and uh, the board's which then at the end we hadn't screwed them we gave those as prizes to people uh, to the to the contestants stuff like that yeah that's awesome so good contest cool <laughs> yeah these are great there's the light next to you if you want to turn it on it might give you a little actually really cold off you oh that's awesome yeah. yeah it's so cool to uh come up here and see this and you know understand what you guys are doing and he's told me about it and tried to talk to me about it to come up a bunch of different times but this is just the one that made the most sense we were just skating and he's like yeah come up you know um a lot of people credit me for pulling this whole thing together but in reality there's so many people behind the scenes when in 2012 when i was first Oh, that'd be somebody important. Hang on. <laughs> it's Colorado calling through the gate. Hi there. You you take you take it. I I interview. <laughs> that's cool. that's Lynn Cooper from Colorado. <laughs> I love Lynn. He's really cool. So uh, well, I need. I wanted to get the very best people to help me out. So I gave Russ Hall a call. Russ and I are like brothers. And um, he said, oh, gosh, yes, I got to be there. The freestyle competition, you know, all the world coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he came up. He was our head judge right off the bat. Gave Jim Goodrich a call. Jimmy, time to come in, up to Canada again and do some photography. What do you think? And he says, yeah. So he's been here for all 12 years, as has Russ. When I say 12 years, sorry, that's it, because of the online competition. So they've been here officially nine years. 
and uh, there were different people that uh, staff wise that we had used in different contests over the years and hey we're gonna do this what do you think yeah a lot of friends were uh, uh, Kevin's friends that were that we all skated together and it's just this big family this team was just oh my gosh yeah let's get together and we all just thrive on it and we go to one night we go out for dinner all of us just us old guys um, to celebrate the you know being together again even though we can't skate like we used to <laughs> we can still <laughs> we can still have fun running a contest together so i'm very blessed to have such a, a great group of people you guys seem like you have a great time yeah we we do we're tired <laughs> we're tired <laughs> it takes us a while to get back bounce back but we're, we do have a good time that's yeah. awesome there you go perfect